Hello everyone, I'm Amalia Maloney with Move to Traveling, and today we're learning from Clinton Donnelly about U.S. expat taxes. He's an enrolled agent and has the business Donnelly Tax Law, which specializes in U.S. tax filing and problem solving for American expats and crypto traders. Clinton, tell us about your business, Donnelly Tax Law. Donnelly Tax Law is a company that focuses on doing U.S. taxes for Americans uh, that live abroad or have assets abroad, and also crypto traders because they have a lot in common. Uh, so I not only in my company prepare taxes, but I also fix tax problems that people have. And expats have a, a lot of problems in particular. Uh, statistically, uh, you can, we can kind of estimate that 70% of U.S. expats don't file tax returns, and, when, and they should. A very common story for people, they'll come overseas, and of course they quit their job, but they came here, so they think, I didn't make any money, you know, I didn't make much, so someone was held back in the States, and you know, when we came around the tax time, they didn't know how to file, they knew there were some special things they had to do, they didn't know who could help them, and eh, they just didn't do it. And then the next year comes around, and they go like, well, I can't file this year because I didn't file last year, you know, and how would the government ever know that I made any money, or you know, whatever. They kind of, so he gets into this uh, snowball. I had this one client who uh, moved to Hong Kong and then was in Singapore. He hadn't filed a tax return for 14 years. He had bought some rental properties over there. And eventually he landed a job working for Amazon in Singapore. He started out as a whatever sort of IT job it was. Well, he worked up to manager and he was bringing down about 200000 a year and realized now he can afford to get current. We, we could, there's actually incredible tax amnesty programs where... All we had to do for him is really file your last three years of returns, six years of bank accounts, and give a statement which says, I'm sorry, uh, legal statements, much affidavit, uh, which I write for him, and uh, you get clean. And it's very easy and affordable. He, however, uh, during his last year, started investing in cryptocurrencies. He had actually taken a mortgage out in his house of $150,000 in Singapore and invested it in cryptocurrencies in the beginning of 2017. And he had made such immense wealth by November, he was completely out of the market. And he had already told me that he was uh, quitting his job. He had just gotten his Singapore citizenship. And he had, you know, given up his U.S. one. Then he decided he was he was quitting Singapore and he was going to travel around the world, <laughs> you know, because he was immensely wealthy. He still has a tax problem because uh, he he didn't really report the last year, which is, you know, will the IRS ever find them? I don't know. Maybe he's hoping not. This is a very common type of story, not the making millions part, but it's very common for people to forget and not do anything. Now I have clients in 47 different countries. I have a lot of clients in the states that have sought me out, even though I'm not in the states. That's my business. About 60% of it is fixing tax problems. Whether you haven't filed or you got an audit or you got to pass debt you need to fix. How does the U.S. tax expats? The U.S. is unique when it, from a tax point of view. And this kind of gets into how I started the company. The U.S. taxes its citizens worldwide on all their income, regardless of where they're living. Like right here in Spain, Spain taxes its citizens in Spain on their worldwide income too. So a lot of people make a big whoop to do out of this taxing worldwide income. They all tax worldwide income except for a few small countries. But the difference about the US is they tax you even if you're not living in the country. So, you know, that's the difference. How did you get into doing US expat taxes? The way I got into this is I actually had lived in the States and I was living in Connecticut and I was able to retire. And I decided I wanted to go back to Panama where I'd worked early on in my career. And I thought, this is a fantastic place to retire. So I, I retired to Panama. All of a sudden, I got exposed to laws in, of other countries in, in the U.S., how the U.S. operates outside of the U.S. And it's very interesting, very intriguing. The long and the short of it was I eventually decided, I said, well, I'd like to get a law degree because I'm having to deal with all these lawyers. So I went and I got a law degree. I got a law degree specializing in international laws of financial regulation. I would never have thought about financial regulation back in the States when I was selling computers. But then outside, as expats, we feel the financial regulation. We feel the difficulty of opening up a bank account and getting your cash moved here and there. So we feel, and I got interested in it. And as I learned and I talked to my friends about what was happening and with the FATCA law had just become, had just passed. Everybody was worried about the FATCA law. People were asking for tax help and I said, well, you need to fill out this form and that form. I knew the forms, but I wasn't filling them out. And eventually I, I realized I could become an enrolled agent. What is an enrolled agent? It's the highest federally licensed tax practitioner. I take a three-day exam by the IRS. Three days on taxes. I mean, CPAs take a three-day exam, but it's about accounting. This is just about taxes. I did that, passed it the first time. 
Can you tell us about what the FATCA law is? A lot of people, expats, get really upset about the fact that they have to report their taxes. And they don't like the FATCA law, and they get very angry and upset at the U.S. And they, they talk about giving up their citizenship. The fact of the matter is, at this point, every country in the world is doing a variation of FATCA. If you were a Spanish citizen and you had bank accounts in Hong Kong, Hong Kong is going to report your bank accounts back to Spain once a year. It, it's not really a... The U.S. Isn't, is not alone in this anymore. They were the pioneers of with the FATCA law, but now everybody's doing it because all the governments want the power. A lot of people get upset that they have to tell the U.S. government about especially with the FBAR form, which is the Foreign Bank Account Report, which overlaps with the FATCA form, 89-38. Can the IRS really know if expats and crypto traders are paying our taxes or not? The fact of the matter is, we live in a society where we can no longer hide our financial lives, particularly from the government. We are living in increasingly transparent situation. If you're like into cryptocurrencies and the future of block currency, the whole thing about cryptocurrencies is it's all... It's all public. It's all visible. I don't know if you know this, but cryptocurrencies, you don't hide with cryptocurrencies. The, every transaction is public. That's the whole beauty of it. It's public. We can't hide financially anymore. If you think that you're an American and you can come to Spain and hide, you should give up on that. From Edward Snowden, we know that the U.S. government monitors our emails. They track our emails. They only need to look at the metadata. The metadata is the who sent the email, who to go to, what was the subject, and what was the date? That pretty much tells it all. Consultants are saying that 46% of crypto traders didn't report their crypto holdings. I would say it's a far higher number that did not report. They didn't know how to report, and I talked to them. I, I, I solved their problems. The U.S. government and you know NSA, was back in 2013 when Snowden was around, he said they were already tracking Bitcoin traders. And all they have to do is track, you know, well, when was the first time you got that email from Binance, which is a foreign exchange? You get an, an email saying confirm, you know, here's a PIN number. Gotcha. You only get an email from Binance if you're opening an account. Because of the FATCA law that the U.S. passed, all the banks in the world twice a year report to the IRS the maximum balances of all American account holders in their banks. Some people say, well, they don't know an American. Well, they will know they have a deadline at the end of this year to know who you are. The penalties are so severe on banks if they don't identify you. All the banks are turning it over. And then when we file our tax return, you know we have to file this FBAR form if you have like over 10,000 total overseas. The IRS already knows how much you have. It's a perjury trap. It's a matter of you admitting it. Okay, and if you don't admit it, then they throw you in jail. It's a catch-22 thing. I mean, we've really moved from a, a system where we voluntarily told the government stuff and then they would come and audit and check your records to prove it. So we're increasingly moving to a society where the government knows expats. We, they know the key things about you. They know where your assets are. They know where your money is moving. And we live transparently. So anyone who's thinking, I can hide from the U.S. government, should just stop. I mean, go watch the movie Matrix and just stop, all right? <laughs> Tell us about crypto trading and your specialty in that. The notion of cryptocurrencies is anchored on this concept called blockchain. And a blockchain is also called a distributed ledger. A ledger is a place where you record things. In a bank, the bank records things, all right? And you might have your checkbook, antiquated thing, but you have your checkbook, you might check it, but the bank's keeping the ledger. And nobody else knows that except you and the bank. But with a distributed ledger like blockchain technology, Many, many, many people have complete access to the ledger. So when somebody updates it with a transaction, that transaction is propagated to many other people. These people are called miners. They all are tracking the ledger themselves. Each miner says, okay, when I track it, and they kind of add up the number at the bottom of the page, and they say, this is the number I get. And then somebody else says, yeah, this is, I got the same number. Somebody else says, I get the same number. And so you have a sense of confidence about what that number is. Somebody else says, I have a number. It's like, well, that's a different number. You know, you're a minority opinion. Therefore, your number is out of whack. And the whole blockchain methodology uses a consensus of opinion on what the current balance is to throw out that one person's number and to disvalidate his status. So, so what this does, it decentralizes where the ledger is. Everybody knows where the ledger is. Everybody knows that this person traded coins to that person, and we all agreed how much it was. We, we've tracked it all. What this does is it takes the bank out of the picture, where now I don't need a bank to clear things. I don't need necessarily a federal government to transact things in cash or dollars. I can, I can do it 
outside of anything. So it's a matter of, so a Bitcoin would be the first, probably the head of all the coins. There's a finite number of Bitcoins, so there's a certain finiteness to it. So it's, it's a, it becomes a scarce commodity and therefore people can assign value to it. And so it becomes a store of value the same way dollars are a store of value or euros or Costa Rican pesos. Blockchain technology is not limited to cash. We could have an election and we could use blockchain to verify the election results. And if somebody's trying to sneak in fake data with a box load of ballots, you know, that could be caught because we would catch that in a blockchain because we'd say, no, those numbers are wrong. We can tell that those numbers are wrong. The permutations of this are rapidly being explored. It's really reaching out. It's gone beyond initial coin offerings, which are kind of like fundraising events, but it's really moving into gaming. It's running into uh, elections. It's going to move into any sort of thing where you're looking for confidence. One of the areas we don't have confidence is, you know, somebody has Facebook and he has so many friends. Well, you know, were these robot friends that he liked him or were they real people? If it has blockchain enabled, then we could validate that they were real people. So it really gets into a trust. Blockchain introduces trust that's independent of banks. It's independent of governments. As a result, it's very threatening to governments. The governments aren't cracking down because the technology is so powerful and revolutionary in terms of a whole way of just treating whole sets of problems that the governments aren't cracking down and I'm starting to read things at the international banking level from the top people. They're already talking about retooling corporate banking systems or, or international banking systems to be you know, blockchain oriented. Clinton, tell us about the books that you've written on U.S. expat taxes. First book was uh, for American expats called The Foreign Earned Income Exclusion. What is the Foreign Earned Income Exclusion? Mm -hmm. which is uh, one of two great laws that the U.S. has to offset the burden of worldwide taxation on Americans. Other countries don't have this. The foreign earned income exclusion can work in any country, and you basically get the first $105,000 of income excluded from U.S. income taxes. You may be subject to self-employment tax, but income taxes. This is worth like $25,000 tax break, right? I wrote a book on this, on how to fill out the form so you can avoid IRS audits. And it turns out that year, the IRS announced that they had a, a multi-year audit initiative of the same form because it is a massive tax break. It's a 320-page book on a single IRS form. It's only one on Amazon. It's still there. It's a great buy. You can get it on my website. That's the first book. I've had several clients who have bought it, and they said they've read it all in one day. About one-third is about how to fill out the form, which really focuses more on key concepts. Mm -hmm. And then another third of it is court cases. These are actually you know, people who tried to claim it, and they got into problems, and they had to go to court, synopsis of their stories. So how does being an enrolled agent with a financial law degree set you apart from accountants who do taxes? Accounting is a very complicated and it's a very regimented field. I mean, there's, there's standards, there's guidelines, and there's rules. But it's all about counting. How do we count this inventory so that we can value your company? How do we count these assets you bought so you can spread the value of the assets or the depreciation of the assets over multiple years? How do we count that? How do we take into consideration that you bought this? They're always wrestling with what value do we place on things so we can characterize the value of a company. Because ultimately... What accountants are doing is saying this company's worth so much money, therefore, bank, you can loan them, or you know, you, or they give you advice that yeah, you could probably buy this, and it'd probably be you could afford it. This is what accountants are into, and there's standards, international standards. A lot of that stuff applies to taxes because they're gonna ask you to come up with an income statement. Well, income statement based on standard accounting practices. On a typical account CPA exam, which these guys study years for, right? Out of a three-day exam, they might have one hour tops on taxes. We're talking basic stuff. I took three days just on taxes. Tax law is constantly changing, whereas accounting law is a little bit more uh, stable. I took a three-day exam, and guess how many questions dealt with the issues that expats face? Zero. Foreign earned income exclusion, foreign tax credit, these weren't mentioned. Neither was, at the time, FBAR, the FATCA form. I see. So these are law-oriented, and the accountant doesn't grab their attention, because it basically is just writing numbers down to them but they don't see it as, because when I explained to my clients, I said, you know, the penalty for not having filed that form is $10,000 and the other one's $10,000. If you don't do that every year, that's $20,000. I have a client, a new client in Panama, who I had known before, but some friends of mine who I saved their bank, their, their bacon, 
because they are they had been working with a Panamanian, a U.S. tax preparer who had screwed up their reforms. Mm -hmm. And for them, I went back. I got them tax amnesty for not having declared their foreign corporations. And at the same time, revised their tax returns and got them sixteen thousand dollars in refunds. This couple told this new guy, and we'll call him Steve. He called me up for help. He said, ah, I don't really trust my old accountant anymore. Turns out his old accountant was a CPA with a PhD, living in Panama for 15 years. He goes, He's getting older. I'm not really sure I trust him anymore. So I said, send me your last three years of returns. I sent him an email last night. I said, Steve, you have two corporations, each that own a, ha a property in Panama. This is a very typical structure. I have a corporation own, a, own real estate. Your former accountant reported it on the foreign asset form, 8938, but he never filled out the foreign corporation forms. There's two forms. They're quite long forms. I said, the failure to file each one of those is $10,000 plus 40% of the value of the company. The company's value is the property, the value of the real estate, right? 40% of the real estate value. That's each company each year that he hasn't, hasn't reported. I said, you know, this is, this is a staggering amount of penalties that you're facing. This is not uncommon when you deal with the domestic CPA. And he goes, well, no, the guy lives in Panama. My, my attitude is like, the guy didn't know. He's a CPA with a PhD. All he sees is accounting. He doesn't see law. Tax is all about law. And that's the issue. And that's where I save, all over the world, I, I save people in these areas. And this is what you run into when you go outside the United States. That, what about anti-money laundering regulations? Expats may not appreciate is that there's a whole set of anti-money laundering regulations that the U.S. government complies with at an international level they comply. One of the key means that the U.S. uses is to require people to report things in their tax return. Back to the whole idea of a perjury trap, you have to report that. And then if a couple years later we find that you didn't do something right, we'll catch you and lie in there. There's this guy in the news, his name is Paul Manafort, one-time campaign manager for Donald Trump. Probably a bad campaign manager, in my opinion, because uh, Trump got rid of him and still won. He had bank accounts all over the Ukraine and Cyprus. Turns out he never reported on his tax return, uh, on his FBAR. He never reported these on his FBAR. On your tax return, Schedule B, at the bottom, it says, do you have any foreign financial accounts? His said no. Every year it says no. So they take that as an intentional proof that he was uh, evading taxes and liability. So, so what else do expats need to report on their taxes? When you're an expat and you go overseas, we have to report our foreign banks, we have to report our foreign assets. Like if I bought, if I bought real estate here, that's a, something I have to report. Mm -hmm. A foreign asset would be any time I'm doing something for investment purposes where the other party is not a U.S. citizen. I buy an apartment from a Spanish person, great. All right, I got a loan from a Spanish bank. Okay, great. I have to report both of those events. They're not just one, they're two events. I have to report it each year it happens. So the first year, I have to report that I bought the property, but that's done after that year. I don't have to report it again. But the next year, uh, I have to keep that loan going as long as I have to report it. So I have to report the loan. Failure to report that loan is a big penalty. So this is how the U.S. government enforces a criminal you know, financial crime, as they they capture us lying. That's the problem I fix for expats. You don't even know you're lying. You have to tell the truth. It's far, far better to over-report and over-disclose. A lot of bloggers will get very worked up about, oh, 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 you don't have to file an FBAR if you don't have $10,000 in the account. Those are the comments from somebody who's trying to hide. First of all, he misstated what I just said. That was a misstatement of the law. They misinterpret the law. They try to get somebody to walk on the precipice by hiding, not realizing that on the other side of this precipice is total financial ruin. You just don't want to do that. What do you recommend for expats who still have businesses in the U.S.? The bottom line is, if you come to Spain, you'll pay more taxes than if you're in the U.S. The U.S. has, has worked really hard to reduce its taxes, especially on corporations. Individual taxes are much lower than other places in the world. You can do all your banking in the U.S. and access the U.S. banking system, but if your business is outside the U.S. for the most part, you can structure it in ways that can minimize some of your tax liabilities in the U.S. So if you have business in the U.S., but you don't have a physical office, and you don't have any employees in the U.S., full-time employee, then there's substantial tax advantages. You get, you get the foreign earned income exclusion for all your income. The other tax, though, is the self-employment tax. Your angle here is if you ever started paying an autonomo of yourself, then we get a certificate from the Spanish government saying you're paying that, and that can be your exclusion of not having to pay self-employment tax. Self-employment tax and the Social Security tax in Spain are similar. It's about 15%. 
Uh, so there's not a real big, you know, you pay in one or the other. But if you're like me, I don't believe in either. I don't believe Social Security's going to be there. It, it is hard, I think, and at least in the U.S. If I were U.S.-based, I'd be all over all the U.S. programs for, like, the research credit. Re oh, that, that, you weren't having business expenses. You were having a research credit. Yeah, yeah. What else are you going to do? Why, I, I want to change the world. Thank you so much for joining us today to learn about U.S. expat taxes. To reach Clinton Donnelly for help with your taxes, visit his site at DonnellyTaxLaw.com, which is also listed in the description below. And for more valuable information on this topic, please click on the link in the description below for the full interview post on our site, MoveToTraveling.com.